Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the society, SEG is committed to advancing the science of economic geology through world-class publications, workshops, webinars, field trips, and conferences, as well as developing the next generation of successful economic geologists. We highly encourage anyone interested in the organization, especially students and early career professionals, to visit the Society's webpage for more information. And a quick reminder for those of you that may not yet be members, now is a great time to join and take advantage of all SEG has to offer. So whether you're an experienced professional or a student that's just starting out, the Society offers numerous opportunities to advance your career. You can visit the website or click on the QR code to learn more about membership. And just on a personal note here, I've been a student member for a long time and I've benefited tremendously from the research and field trip grants offered by SEG, as well as getting more involved in the society. So I strongly encourage those of you that are students to join. This is the second installment in the SEG 2023 Base Metals webinar series. It's an open forum for interaction with industry and academic experts. We'll discuss the significance of zinc exploration and the critical role that it will play during the energy transition. With forecasts suggesting that increased production of zinc will be necessary to meet global demand over the coming decade, there's a need for the next generation of geologists to better understand the full scope of the metals value chain and exploration potential. FEG would once again like to thank MapTech for their generous support as our base metal webinar series sponsor for 2023. Uh, just a quick introduction. I am a PhD candidate at the Colorado School of Mines. I study ore and gang mineral textures of low sulfidation epithermal deposits. I got my MS in geology from Colorado School of Mines in 2018 and my BA in geology down the road at CU Boulder. And I'm currently involved in SEG uh, in a number of ways, but primarily as the chair of the SEG Students Committee. And this is a reminder that the main Q&A will, a, will come at the end of the webinar. Though attendees are welcome to place questions in the Q&A tab during the lectures, if you think of something that you'd like to ask and the, and the presenters can respond in that channel. And reminder, if you wanna, if you see a question that's really good you'd like answered, you can upload it. This is just the general webinar outline for today, presentations in that order, and then the panel. So to our first presenter, Paul Benjamin with Ocean Partners. After graduating from the Camborne School of Mines, Paul spent over 20 years involved in the design and supply of mineral processing equipment with GEC Mechanical Handling and Mezzo Minerals. In 2006, he joined Brook Hunt Wood McKenzie, where he was a key contributor to the company's renowned fundamental analysis of the global copper value chain, with a particular emphasis on mine supply and the concentrate market. Since 2018, Paul has been head of research at Ocean Partners, who specialize in the trading of copper, zinc, lead, and precious metal concentrates as well as related byproducts and secondary minerals. So at this point, I'm gonna let Paul take it over. Okay, hello everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me. Yeah. And hopefully now see me. Looks good. Um, yeah, well, thank you for the introduction there, Lauren. Um, the the uh, first slide, um, was was just a little bit of presentation of myself, but, but but you've already done that. But I think if it's sort of two two key takeaways, which I'd like, like to sort of present, um, mainly because uh, I understand that you know a lot of the audience is students, and you're sort of you know, planning out you know, your your career in the industry. Um, the first one is like for me personally, um, that you know I've I've been working in the in the mining industry for thirty eight years in three distinct roles. But I've never actually worked for a mining company, so there's you know just just to say there's lots of um, there, there's lots of sort of different roles out there for your consideration. And I think the other point I'd like to make on on, on the career front um, is that um, aside from my first job um, when I was a graduate trainee at GEC Mechanical Handling, I've never really had a proper job interview. All the other career changes I've made have been through people knowing me and contacts and whatever. So that you know just emphasises you know mining is a small industry 
um, you know, it's important to maintain the networking and it's um, important to be nice to people, I think. So, um, yeah, because you never know when you're going to come up against uh, so, 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 someone again. So, um, yeah, that's, that's just a sort of little, little bit of sort of context uh, uh, around the career which, which, uh, which, which, which Lauren presented. But the main thing I want to talk about tonight um, in, in 20 minutes, and so apologies if it's a little bit of a series of points rather than a coherent narrative, is um, yeah, just just um, uh, answer the question. You know, what are we looking for in in terms of the ideal um, zinc deposit from the co commercial perspective? Um, and yeah, maybe provide a little bit of context um, for the, uh, the, the the technical talks which you've coming you've got coming up from um, Peter and and, and um, Sarah. So I thought I'd start just by <clears throat> you know thinking about what 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 are the sort of you know, some of the main best base metals used for. And how do they fit into the energy transition, which is you know one of the themes of, of, of tonight's session? You know, copper is, is the first one. It's sort of the biggest of the, 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 the metals I'm considering. And you can see from the the, 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 the first chart that you know the, the, the usage of copper is absolutely dominated by electrical conductivity. And yeah, you, you've probably seen all sorts of statistics. You know, the normal internal combustion engine car. Uh, uses 20 kilograms of copper, an electric vehicle uses 80 kilograms of copper, you know, greater copper intensity in you know, uh, wind turbines and photovoltaic farms you know, compared to fossil fuel generation of copper. It's very easy to sort of you know, make a good story about you know, how copper fits into the, um, the, 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 the energy transition uh, and also um, how you know, we're, it's going to be very much in demand. You know, um, um, it takes a lot of investment um, to sort of build a big project to you know, re realize the uh, economies of scale of a finely disseminated porphyry copper deposit. Um, and there isn't, despite the fact that copper's been at $10,000 a tonne in the last year, uh, there isn't a great deal of, um, uh, of new activity going on, you know, new, new mine construction activity going on. Um, you know, it takes five or six years to sort of build a big copper mine. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think sort of the tight copper market in, in, in the second half of this decade is already uh, more or less uh, assured. Um, moving on to lead, a uh, completely different um, story. Um, its um, usage is dominated by batteries, you know, um, lead acid batteries, um, uh, re yeah, re replacement and, 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 and original stationary and moving. Um, and of course, you know, a lead acid battery can't be used in a, an electric vehicle as the main power source because it's, you know, power to weight ratio is, is or weight to power ratio is, is, is too high. So, so long term, you know, the, 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 the um, sort of the use of, of lead is going to decline, but it is a very long term picture because at the moment, all the um, you know, targets about you know, stopping the sale of new internal combustion engines by 2030 in the UK, 2035 and 2040 in other markets. But there's still going to be the, the significant um, replacement markets out there. And then also, you know, the, the lead acid batteries are going to be used in sort of stationary power storage um, um, applications uh, where, where, where their, 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 their weight isn't so important. Um, so what we are going to see is that um, the, the, the use of um, secondary lead is going to increase uh, recycled batteries in, 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 in essence. Yeah, that already makes up around 64% of, of lead demand is, is satisfied by secondary production. And there's going to be sort of declining interest in primary lead mines unless the lead, you know, the lead concentrates produced also has a, a high amount of um, you know, a, a, a other minerals of interest. Uh, silver, obviously, being the, 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 the main one. And I haven't got the chart here, but there's a very good story about silver and using photovoltaic cells. So what we're talking about is, is, is the lead that comes from mines is really going to be used as a carrier for other metals which are, are, are interested in the energy transition. And then finally, moving on to zinc, which is sort of the, the, the main subject tonight. Um, you, know, the, the, you can see from the, the, the right hand chart, the main use is galvanizing surface protection for, for, for steel. Honestly, um, you know, you could make arguments that um, um, yes, of course, you know, the, the frames of photovoltaic cells need to be galvanized and protected. The towers for wind turbines you know, will, will need to be galvanized. But there's not such a clear link, in my opinion, between you know, the, the, the changes in the zinc market, which, which are coming forward, 
and the uh, and, and the energy transition as there is for lead, silver, and copper. Um, you know, the new batteries which which may use zinc so far in the future, if you like, that they're more upside risk than anything that can be built into any sort of base case forecasts for um for for for, for, for metal consumption. So that just sort of sets the scene a little bit. Now a little bit about metal markets. Um, and if, if I think if, if you just take away one thing from tonight, uh, look at the, 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 this chart. This chart shows the, um, uh, the annual average cash price for zinc, sorry, the, man, the monthly average cash price for zinc on the LME. And, and, the, and the message is metal prices are cyclical. They go up and down. Um, you know, and just to sort of you know, talk our way through the, the last sort of peak and trough to sort of give you a, a little bit of a context, you know, post-COVID, yeah, there's massive logistical problems. Most base metals went up in price. And zinc actually did more so than, than most others because um, zinc smelters in particular are, are, are high energy consumers. And when Russia invaded Ukraine, energy prices went up. A lot of the metal prices, uh, sorry, a lot, a lot of the European zinc smelters shut or, or went on reduced uh, production because of the high energy prices. And you know, supply demand fundamentals. The price shot up above four thousand dollars a ton, um, which was absolute. You know, uh, is actually an all-time high. This year, it's all changed. There's plenty, plentiful new mine supply. You know, new projects coming online in the far east of Russia, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Brazil, Bosnia later this year, DRC next year. Uh, and you know, the, the, the power prices have come off in Europe, so there's no shortage of smelting capacity. Also, and that's set against a fairly negative. Um, you know, economic outlooks or investor confidence has waned, um, if you like, and, you know, sort of sort of speculative buying. And the price has now gone down um, sort of below $2,500 a tonne. And we're already cutting, the point about that is we're already cutting into the cost curve. You, you may have seen that um, uh, the Tara mine, which is owned by Bleeding in, in Ireland, you know, traditionally quite a high cost producer, that's already gone on to care and maintenance. So, you know, the next up, uptick in, um, in, in, in prices probably isn't too far away. Um, and if you're any, anyone um, thinking about investing, now is probably the uh, ideal time for a bit of counter-cyclical investment in you know, base metals in, in, in general and, 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 and zinc in particular. And the other thing I wanted to show um, is this chart. Uh, the, the yellow line is the requirement for zinc mine production. This actual one is produced by my former uh, employers with McKenzie, but there's yeah, plenty of other um, um, sort of yeah, supply demand forecasts on, on the market. Um, uh, uh, and the, the blue block, if you like, that is the amount of um, zinc production which is expected or forecasted from yeah, the mines which are already in existence or, or already um, um, yeah, being built, yeah, the so-called base case production capability. Um, yeah, and, and um, as Lauren said at the start, you know, despite the fact there isn't this compelling narrative from, from, from the from the energy transition, um, you know, zinc for zinc um, consumption is expected to grow. Um, around about one point four percent per annum is shown on this chart on average between twenty twenty two and twenty forty. That's that's lower than what it's been so far this century. That's above two percent per annum. Um, you know, China, which has been driving a lot of that, is. Um, is going to a sort of a less commodity intensive economy. So what we've got driving um, uh, this, this growth now is really sort of industrialization trends in India and other sort of emerging markets in um, you know, Southeast Asia, um, you know, in, in, in Indonesia uh, and, 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 and play, play, play places like that. And of course, set against that, you've got reserve and depletion of existing mines. Um, uh, the, you know, all, all grades are going down. The life of mine uh, is, 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 is being, um, uh, yeah, reached in, in, in some cases. Uh, and that yeah, gap opens up. I, th I think on that chart, it's opening up from around about 2027. We are going to need some supply from new mines we, 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 which don't actually exist at the moment. And of course, what, what you see on that graph never actually happens. Uh, either new mines get built or existing mines get extended, you know, which is quite you know, common in the zinc industry because there's so many underground mines. Or if the zinc's not available, the market adapts and the substitution thrifting, that sort of thing, which brings the yellow line down. But, but this, this sort of analysis is quite useful for giving us some idea of the, of the stress that the, the, the market is going to be under. Um, so, so I suppose the, the, the next little point I wanted to make on markets um, is, um, 
yeah, you know, just a little bit regionally, a um, little bit of regional output and demand. And this is concentrate. So when I'm talking about demand, I'm talking about smelter demand for zinc concentrate. Um, but, 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 but yeah, that, that is a reasonable proxy for regional demand for metal, um, you know, to, 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 to some extent. And I think this, this thing's mainly North American focused. So yeah, you've got the situation not just in zinc, and actually, it's actually worse in copper, where you're um, um, exporting concentrates um, to sort of you know, China and the Far East, mainly a bit to Europe, um, Korea, particularly for, 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 for the US. But you've actually got to import refined metal. So the sort of charts we looked at on my previous slide, yeah, showing this looming supply gap, is actually quite often used by junior mining companies as you know part of their uh, argument about yeah why new mines are needed. But it's it's, it's not actually not only new mines. Um, yeah, if, if you re yeah one shortcut to filling the supply gap would actually be to process more of your concentrates um, in in country. Uh, of course, yeah, and that that. Yeah, you know, it's not easy because it is actually cheaper to sort of um, uh, you know export your concentrates and you know incur, incur a treatment charge than it is to build a new smelter and take on all the capex and environmental liability and all the rest of it. So if that actually is going to happen, it's, I think it's probably going to have to be um, uh, driven by sort of you know government tax breaks or or or, 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 or something like that. Uh, but um, you know it, it, that that just provides a sort of a little bit of context to the way way the market works and you know regional security for all the sort of critical minerals and um, strategic minerals things now included on the U.S. Um, strategic mineral list, uh, etc. So it, it, you, you don't you don't just think in terms of mines; you need to think in terms of the uh, entire value chain. So this now sort of brings me on to sort of the, the meat of the discussion. You know. Um, what sort of you know zinc deposits are we really looking for? We spoke a little bit about the byproducts that we're looking for, um, but yeah, you know, uh, you know, Ocean Park is is, is is a concentrate trader, so I, I, I think about things in terms of concentrate. Um, but of course, the, the concentrates that produce that is the end product from all the processing, the the milling, the uh, mining, and of course the geology which went on to sort of um, you know, br bring bring that about. So what are the factors that are affecting um, zinc concentrate quality and, you know, and, and, and you know, essentially driving the, the question about what sort of you know, deposits does the market really need? And I suppose you can think about the elements in, in, in different categories. Of course, the main one, zinc. Hopefully, you know, if, if, if it's salarite, which, which most commercial zinc deposits are, um, you're sort of, you know, well above 50 percent. Um, but, but of course, you know, if you're not if you're you know, if you're not above fifty percent, you've got to ask, you know, what 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 else is there? Of course, one of the other obvious answers is sulfur, and that's useful in in the industry. It's it's, it's useful to your smelter customers. The uh, the the sulfur is um, that goes to sulfur dioxide and then sulfuric acid during the smelting process, and the acid credit is a um, you know important part of the smelter revenue. And then you've got the other minerals of value. Um, either paid or unpaid. Um, for example, you know, silver is quite is, is usually paid for in 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 in, in a zinc concentrate. Um, and lead maybe depending on on, on your customer. Um, but but even if you've got something which generally isn't paid, like indium, if the smelter can recover it, it's going to make your um, concentrate more attractive than other concentrates, and sort of particularly in a slightly sloppy market. Like we've got at the moment, you know, you, you've got an assured market um, for, 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 for the future. Uh, whereas, you know, people who don't have these um, these unpaid uh, metals of value may struggle to find the market or have to um, incur a higher treatment charge in order to sell their, their, their materials. And the other thing which is really important and becoming more important at the moment is um, uh, the residue forming metals. Um, you, you may have read that one of the big byproducts of a, of a, of a smelter is a, um, a material called jarosite, which has to be disposed of, that it incurs a cost. So you're, you're, you're going to have to pay penalties if your silica and iron content in, in, in your concentrate is too high, and that, that's often accompanied by your zinc concentrate being low. And then finally, you've got the deleterious elements. Uh, you know, this is stuff which either um, you know, causes problems in the smelting process and has to be removed, chlorine and fluorine, for example. You know, they'll tend to produce hydrochloric acid and hydrofluoric acid rather than sulfuric acid. And then stuff which is um, 
you know, detrimental to the, you know, the, the final zinc in, in, in its end use um, environment. So, you know, cadmium and then, then obviously stuff like mercury is, is, is hazardous and, 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 and um, um, you yeah, know, the smelters, you know, incur extra cost handling that. Other things, you know, and this is you know, to do with the ore body, but maybe a little bit tangential, you know, if, if there's too much sulfur there, you know, you might have a tendency for self-heating. How, how fine do you have to grind the material in order to make a sellable concentrate? You know, that, 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 that feedback, A, you know, is getting, the, the average, the industry average is getting finer and finer, which is causing problems for the smelters. And also, it, you know, fine concentrates are harder to dewater. Um, so uh, the, the moisture content can, can particularly be, 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 become an issue. So this all like, feeds into the metallurgy. And then finally, um, the other thing which I would say um, relates to um, co co concentrate quality is, you know, who owns it and where it is. And this be the responsible sourcing uh, for a trading company like ourselves and the, the ESG uh, matters for, you know, the actual smelters who have got shareholders and um, banks looking at their activities. That is going to be a, 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 an increasing consideration as well. But I think that's a subject for, for another talk rather than um, um, sort of focusing too much on it to, to, to today. So wrapping up, uh, I'm aware <laughs> the clock's ticking. Uh, and this, this map just shows the existing universe of, um, of you know, some of the, the 30 of the top, you know, um, uh, concentrate producers at the moment. Yeah, there's fair a lot of, uh, the yellow spheres there so you know the industry is well used to um you know treating um you know material which has already got some degree of um uh, of you know either deleterious or, or residue forming elements um the the red ones are actually two quite recently uh, open mines uh sort of much more complex uh in the metallurgy and you know that they, they are um they're sold at a significant discount to the market but of course, the green ones, you know, they're the ideal ones. And I, I draw, I just draw a little distinction there between low silver and high silver. The low silver sells in China very well because um, um, the, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese smelters that they buy at the Western silver price, but they have to sell at their own domestic silver price, uh, which includes a VA, a non-refundable VAT um, deduction. So there's, a, there's an actual arbitrage there. So um, Chinese smelters aren't too keen on high silver concentrates but korean smelters are so you know the, the, this goes to show that the, 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 the geology of your mine that feeds really through to you know which customers you're you're, you're, you're selling your, your 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 final product to um and then this just um shows sort of the universe of some of the projects which are out there um which are going to be helping to fill in that supply gap which lauren referred to and, and we, we looked at on my, my second chart a lot less green on that. So um, if, 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 if as geologists you're finding um, sort of you know de de deposits with um, you know you know low deleterious elements, low residue forming elements, preferably a bit of something else in there as well, a bit of silver or copper or something. That that that's uh, really what 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 we're looking for. Um, so just to sort of wrap that up, yeah, what is the ideal zinc ore body? Uh, 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 and as it will produce the concentrate that is readily saleable across the entire commodity cycle. So that means, you know, more than 50% zinc, hopefully, low residue forming elements and low deleterious elements. Hopefully some byproduct value, you know, co copper, and the copper could be, you know, a separate concentrate or, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, a, a, a copper in the, uh, in, in the zinc concentrate and silver there preferred. You know, technology metals, I mentioned indium, but also things like gallium and germanium, commonly associated with zinc, they're definitely an advantage. But as I hopefully highlighted, lead on its own is becoming less important unless the, the, the galena is um, you know, closely uh, associated with, 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 with silver. And yeah, finally, the, the location and ownership of the mine yeah, will ideally minimise any responsible sourcing issues. And you know, ease the way through permitting. You know, it's not in a biosensitive area or on First Nation lands or whatever. And yeah, you know, that's far easier to, 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 to sort of sort of gain permitting and, and bring these mines into production. So look, that's just a very quick skate through the uh, uh, through the um, you know the, the, the universe that we work in. 
Um, I, I think there's going to be an opportunity to ask questions sort of whenever if all the speakers have spoken. But um, I've, I've put my email address there, you know, to, just, to, just in case you do want to get in touch with, with, with anything specific. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, Lauren, I will hand back to you. Thank you very much, Paul. That was very interesting and tied in really well with, with our first webinar on copper. So I'm excited to talk about the differences in those markets. We're gonna move on to our second, our second panelist, Sarah Gleason. Sarah received a BA in geology from Trinity College Dublin and a PhD in geochemistry from the Royal School of Mines Imperial College London. Subsequently, she held postdoctoral positions at the Natural History Museum London and the University of Leeds before moving to the University of Alberta, Canada in 2001. As of 2016, she is the W3 professor in mineral resources at Fry Berlin and leads the inorganic and isotope geochemistry section at the GFZ. She is an associate editor of Economic Geology and on the editorial board of Geochemical Perspectives. She serves on several advisory boards to scientific institutions and international grant funding panels. Sarah has a broad research interest in mineral deposits, genesis, hydrothermal fluid flow, and water rock interaction. Her research has recently focused on base metal deposits in sedimentary basins, sedimentary geochemistry, diagenesis, and ore forming processes. All right, Sarah, I will let you take it from here. So I can stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I need to pull up my... Okay. So good evening, everybody. It's not, almost nighttime here in Germany. And uh, yeah, Lauren asked for an introduction slide and she's just given a great tour through my biography, but uh, I know there's quite a few students on the line. Um, and so instead of telling you what I've done, I'm gonna tell you what I learned in every place I worked in. So, um, so I come from Central Ireland and I did my first degree in Dublin and uh, there I learned the importance of field work, of fin sections and of critical thinking. Then I moved to London to do my PhD and then I learned about how to analyze things with all kinds of geochemical techniques, how to QA, QC data and how to write scientific papers and a thesis. I then did a postdoc at the University of Leeds and there I learned how to successfully write a grant and sell my science better. And after that, I moved to Alberta, and that's really where I had to learn how to teach, how to supervise students. But it's really where my career started in terms of building partnerships with uh, researchers in, in the surveys and also with industry. And I did a lot of field work in the Yukon and in, in Alaska and the Shield um, as part of that. Now I live in Germany, where I'm learning a lot about geothermal, and other parts of, of geo resources, um, and also a lot more about interacting with politics, both German politics and, and EU politics. So every time I've moved, I've learned something really important, and that's a lesson, I think, as well. Um, so, but today I'm going to talk about pyrite. Now, you're probably wondering why I want to talk about pyrite. Um, and this is in response to some work that we've been doing. Um, for quite some time on zinc deposits. And today I'm gonna to focus on some zinc deposits in Australia. And that work was in partnership with Tech Australia and also with uh, Mount Isa Mines. So I'm going to give you two case studies um, from, um, from the Carpentaria province in Australia. And I just wanna thank um, Marcus Olsa, Franti Bilka, Christoph Kusebauk, and my past and present grad students who were involved in these various research projects and to point out that everything today I'm going to talk about is uh, actually already published and recently published in these two papers here, the first one by Joe Magnol and the second one by Phil Rieger. And both the papers are open access, so anybody can get them. And the data sets are also open access. And I think that's really important. So you can download the data and play with it yourself and decide if what I'm saying is correct or not. So why am I choosing to talk about pyrite when we're talking about zinc deposits? Well, pyrite is an archive, not just of uh, metals, also of sulfur. 
And a sedimentary basin is formed in all kinds of different environments. So basically, you can see you can form pyrite in the water column. So it can tell you something about thin sedimentary processes. Um, during diagenetic changes, as you bury the rocks, of course, we know all about hydrothermal pyrite. And then, of course, in a lot of these basins, these rocks get subsequently deformed or metamorphosed and pyrite forms in those environments as well. So basically, pyrite can really talk us through and bring us through the history of the sedimentary basin and what the metals and the sulfur are doing at different times. Um, we know it's commonly found as a gang mineral associated with base metal sulfides, and certainly it's found in, in a lot of the giant sink deposits. Um, we also know that people do assay and do bulk geochemistry on pyrite because often it's intersected in drill cores. Um, and if that pyrite is strata bound, it has a geophysical signature, which means that you know, we can detect uh, thickness, thick layers of pyrite in the subsurface and we can put a hole in them. But really what we want to know is that pyrite actually telling us anything about zinc mineralization. So the deposits I'm going to talk about today are deposits called plastic dominance um, lead zinc deposits, and they're our most important zinc resource. Some of you will have heard of these deposits before um, as FedEx deposits. Um, these are large, massive sulfide deposits dominated by sphalerite um, and galena, which also mines a little bit of silver. And they're hosted in marine carbonaceous mudstones. And it's thought that in most cases, there's no direct magmatic input. So they're, they're really made by basal processes. So uh, we get our strata bound sphalerite, galena, um, and also pyrite. And sometimes in some of these, these deposits, we also have barite. So over the world, we have seven basins that are really supercharged, if you like, with zinc. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a bit about this one down here, this area of, of Northern Australia. Now there's a lot of debates about the models for these deposits. Um, sort of the earliest um, model is the SEDEX model, which invokes a plume of metalliferous um, fluids, basically exhaling onto the sea floor and then precipitating the metals and then they're just buried. So this is sort of a thin sedimentary model. And um, we've been sort of pushing a different model. It's a model, it's not a new model. We were certainly not the first people to suggest it, um, but actually that a lot of these deposits are formed in the subsea floor and their replacements in the subsurface. Um, if you think about a pirate halo or a footprint associated with those two different models, you might expect some different geometries. So if our fluids are exhaling into the seafloor, you'd expect that some of the metals might be dispersed quite widely and particularly laterally in the currents at the bottom of the ocean. So you may get a sort of a wide lateral halo. And certainly this is something that, that Ross Large and his group have advocated for for, for a very long time. Um, in this other form of deposit, though, what you might expect if the mineralization is forming in the subsurface, obviously the halo is controlled by the permeability of the sediments that it sits in. So, um, so in this case, the, the, the footprints will be much smaller, and you might predict that maybe it's, it's going to be, you know, maybe 100 meters or something um, around the deposit. So I'm going to take you to the Carpentaria, this is in Northern Australia here, and in two of the great basins that produce these giant zinc deposits. The MacArthur Basin up here, where we have exceptionally well-preserved 1.64 billion marine sedimentary rocks, not a lot of metamorphism or deformation. You can really see the original textures. But then down here in the Mount Isa Basin, we have many deposits and the, there's, they are deformed and there's much more metamorphism um, and that makes the story a little bit more complicated. And both the, the SEDEX and C4 replacement model arguments, if you like, um, plays out in, in these deposits. Um, these deposits have been used as examples of both types of processes. So we're gonna start with Joe Magnell's work in the TNA sub-basin. Um, and, and this is a tech resources uh, property. And uh, in, 
here we're looking at mineralization, which is host in the Barney Creek formation. And we uh, sampled some drill holes sort of through the highly mineralized part of the basin, weakly mineralized, and then into as far into the background as we could get. And Joe did um, lots of petrography, microprobe, and I'm going to show you some of the um, analysis of the pyrite geochemistry. And the idea here was to really test whether we're seeing maybe this type of pattern or this type of pattern when we look at the chemistry of the trace element chemistry. So the petrography that we see here, we basically see two main generations of pyrite. The first generation of pyrite that we see is very, very fine grained. Um, this is pyrite one here, and this we interpret as being diagenetic. It's formed um, in the sediments. And we find this away from the deposits. Um, and it's basically all over the basin. And in fact, at this time, you find this pyrite all over multiple basins in this part of the world. It's forms of fine grain aggregates. And I want you to look at the scales here because we're going to talk about laser ablation data. We've hit it with a laser. And one of the challenges with the rocks I'm talking about today is they're really fine grained. And that means you have to be very careful in terms of how you're interpreting your data and what you're hitting with your laser. So here you can see this is uh, our, our diagnostic pyrite and it makes aggregates and these can be analyzed by laser. We also have hydrothermal pyrite. These are microprobe maps and you can see when we find the hydrothermal pyrite, it lights up with elements like arsenic and lead. So Joe basically did a, a whole bunch of analyses, really checked where the spots were and this is just a principal component plot of some of the elements that are encountered in this pyrite. And you can see basically the geochemistry falls into three groups. Over here, we have the diagenetic pyrite, and these are dominated by moly and nickel. And over here, we have the hydrothermal pyrite, where you get elements like arsenic, lead, and thallium. And there are some late veins in the system. And actually, when you analyze the pyrites in there, they have a bit more silver and copper, but they sit off to the side. So as a result, Joe suggested that you see arsenic, lead, and thallium. This is commonly enriched in TINA. This is also the same in the giant HYC deposit. And moly and nickel, I think Ross has published on this many, many times. These are common trace elements in diagenetic pyrite. So he suggested that in the TINA area, you could use this ratio to separate out basically our pyrites. You can tell the difference between diagenetic and hydrothermal pyrites. And so um, this trace element works for distinguishing these two pyrite types. And when you sort of map out the chemistry of the pyrites, he's shown that you get this trace element anomalism. It extends hundreds of meters into the hanging wall stratigraphy but not very far laterally. So in other words, the, the, if you like, the pattern of the pyrite chemistry fits with more of this epigenetic model here. However, one of the interesting things is if you go above the ore into the hanging wall and you look at the diagenetic pyrite, sometimes you do see these cryptic low volume hydrothermal overgrowths. So this is an example, 20 micron, these are our, our hydrothermal, our diagenetic pyrite, and you can see this overgrowth, which is hydrothermal, that has this arsenic signature growing on top of that. So some of these diagenetic pyrites, if you were to analyze them, um, you may get mixed analysis with a little bit of hydrothermal um, uh, trace elements in there. Now, if we go further south into the um, Mount Isa Basin and to George Fisher, which is a producing mine, um, everything gets much more complicated. And that's because the Mount Isa Basin is both deformed and metamorphosed. And as a result of that, there's been a lot of debate about when these deposits formed. So there's wide time spans of proposed mineralizing events. Some people say they're SEDEX. Some people say they're epigenetic, maybe, but during you know, the earlier part of the basin uh, formation. And, and other people say they're associated with the deformation in the area. And of course, one of the questions here is always, what is the relationship with the copper at Mount Isa? So Phil Reader did his PhD in this area in George Fisher. And so we were very fortunate because when we're doing these studies, we really want to know what the background looks like. And he managed to find a hole here at Shovel Flats that gives us the background baseline to compare our data to. 
and then the detailed sampling of four drill cores in the mine. And I just want to point one here in George Fisher, when we talk about the hanging wall samples, we're talking about actually these layers of mudstone in between the ore um, lenses. We couldn't unfortunately get samples all the way through the, if you like, the hanging wall to the whole deposit. So uh, Phil did about 2000 laser ablations. Um, quite a proportion of these were rejected because we go back and we look at where the holes are in our samples by SEM to be sure that we know what pyrogenetic phase we're hitting. So this is what the pre-or pyrite looks like um, at, George Fisher, or at George Fisher and also at the shovel flats with the background hole. And you get these beautifully laminated rocks and these are our layers of pyrite, siltstone and mudstone. And when you go into thin sections, they're tiny, tiny little grains basically of pyrite. And if we zoom in again, you form these aggregates. And if you zoom in again, you'll see they have spherical centers and euhedral overgrowth. And this is typical of what the diagenetic pyrite looks like here. This is the first stage of pyrite. And Phil has done sulfur isotopes on this. And this is not th nothing to do with pre or nothing to do with the hydrothermal system. So what does the chemistry of, of this pyrite looks like? Well, obviously, Phil looked at all the chemistry. And he decided that really the chemistry of George Fisher, the trace elements can best be discussed by choosing thallium, moly, and nickel. Um, and this is sort of the background values here. And you can see that in our, our barren hole, the pyrite is a bit more enriched towards the thallium corner, um, whereas in the mine itself, um, you also get that, um, get that signature. Um, but also you do see some um, pyrites that have trace element chemistry that are a bit more enriched in moly and a bit more enriched in nickel. So then when we get into the ore, what does it look like? Well, well, well there's a really early stage of, of strata bound ore that has very pale colored sphalerites. And to us, we've just come from the MacArthur Basin, it looks a lot like the MacArthur type of mineralization. And that's what Phil is defining here as or phase or phase one and uh, again really 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 fine fine grains this is all pyrite uh in here and um and this is our basically where these this is our or stage one where where the um where the arrows are pointing to these are the areas he's trying to analyze and when you do that, you actually find that this ore stage one pyrite is really enriched in thallium and you don't get a lot of moly and nickel in it. When you look at the other trace elements that you have um, in this ore stage one, you have thallium, copper, cobalt, nickel, manganese, silver, moly. So there's a suite of trace elements um, along with the thallium in this ore stage. Or stage two, which is volumetrically the really big stuff that they're mining, or stage two and three, looks quite different. So you can see these laminated earlier pyrite layers, and now they're deformed, and you can see these, what they call the breccias come in. So, um, and you can sort of zoom in to the thin section, and what you can see here, this is the or stage one pyrite, and you can see it's all been broken up, the layers are disrupted, and you've got much coarser grain mineralization coming in with sphalerite, with galena, and the pyrite in this ore stage two is, is cubic and euhedral, and so it looks quite different. It is also really different in chemistry. So it contains much more nickel and much more moly. And when you look at the trace elements, it's missing a bunch of all those other trace elements, and really it's dominated by nickel and cobalt. Or stage three is where we first see the copper in these holes. So we, we, we now start to see chalcopyrite in here. And this is what the third generation of um, pyrite looks like, really coarse in an assemblage, again with sphalerite and with chalcopyrite. And when you look at the chemistry of this, it's also very nickel enriched. It's relatively moly poor. Um, but when you look at the other trace elements that are present, you're really 
um, you, you've got some copper, some nickel, some cobalt, and again, you're sort of missing all these other place items. So if we put it all together, what can we say? We can say that the chemistry of the pyrite is actually giving us an insight into multiple ore forming events um, at George Fisher. So um, this is all the data, but Phil has broken it out as sort of heat maps here. We can see the, the pre ore pyrites have quite complex compositions. The first generation or stage one, which is what I call MacArthur style mineralization, has this distinctive thallium um, signature. Or stage two, we, we interpret forms from recrystallization and recycling of some of that or stage one pyrite, and the trace elements have been sort of kicked out of the pyrite structure. Or stage three, we have um, basically um, the pyrite signature is, is changing. It has some copper, some nickel, and cobalt. And whenever I see copper, nickel, and cobalt together, I have to ask myself, are we looking at a mafic? signature here, because those are the sort of things you'd expect to find um, from a mafic source rock. So we can tell the difference. So what happens if we look at Tina and George Fisher together? They're in two quite different basins, but the same age rocks. And um, so if we try to compare them using the Tina index that Joe developed, what do we see? So this here is a, a summary from the literature that Ross Large put together of all the pyrite analysis from the Proterozoic. And then we have Tina diagenetic, George Fisher diagenetic, Tina ore stage, and George Fisher ore stage. And immediately you can see there's a difference here. And of course it makes sense because we know George Fisher has got lots of nickel in the pyrite, at least in the later ore stages. So that's gonna move it on this um, axis. But it's also got not as much arsenic as, as the uh, pyrites do in Tina. So if we zoom in, what we can say is that Tina and George Fisher, if you look at the diagenetic pyrites in terms of the probability density function from using this ratio, they actually look pretty similar. So that's kind of interesting, but they do look different to background um, in terms of as defined by this sort of proterozoic um, compilation by Ross Large. And we confirm that actually the ores, um, the pyrite at the different ore stages in George Fisher does look different to the Tina pyrite. So um, the diagenetic pyrite at Tina and George Fisher have comparable com com um, compositions. And clearly the mineralized basins or sub basins look different to just the general background proterozoic pyrite. The Tina index doesn't work at George Fisher because there's less arsenic and more nickel in that system. And um, that's because there are some local sub-basin controls on some trace elements, but also I think that it's telling us something potentially about the source of metals in these two basins. And that source may have slightly different trace element compositions or be delivering different trace element compositions in the hydrothermal system. So I hope I've convinced you that pyrite chemistry is a useful tool for understanding hydrothermal systems. Pyrite commonly occurs throughout the parogenesis in these deposits. Um, and that really gives us an, an ability to think about the genesis um, and what's happening with the metal budgets at different stages of the development of the system. However, I think you have to be really careful in extrapolating data from different sub-basins. So I think each sub-basin has a different um, sedimentation in terms of, um, and therefore a different uh, detrital chemistry. It has a slightly different um, diagenetic history because um, of its dealing with, with different hydrological situations or different microbiological situations. And certainly as I've shown here, there's potentially the hints of different source rocks in some of these different basins as well. Um, the process of laser ablation in ICPMS is really a, a powerful tool, but it's only a powerful tool if you do the petrography first. And all my students, I lock them in a lab and I don't allow them to come out for six months until they've done a really fantastic petrographic study. And it's really important that you document from the hand specimen, from the core, basically, to the thin section, to the grain scale. And um, 
And I would encourage you, there's a lot of papers being published on laser ablation data on minerals out there. And the first thing you should look at with those papers is this Petra, um, the, the paragenetic or the petrography that goes with the data. And quite often you'll see there's a picture of one grain and it's like, this is, you know, whatever, sphalerite one or pyrite one or galena or epido or whatever. And there's no picture of what that, the context of that grain in terms of the hand specimen. And so I would say then at that point, you have to question how useful this data really is if you can't tie it back to the rock. So when you're dealing with these really fine grain rocks, you have to check the location of every analysis afterwards to really be sure what you're dealing with. Did you hit what you thought you hit? And particularly because in fine grain rocks, you're gonna get a lot of mixed ablations and you may want to either deal with those separately or discard them from your data set. And then the last thing I would say is you can get value um, from the bulk geochemistry data that, for example, our industry colleagues produce, bulk lithic geochemistry data. Um, these single grain data where you're identifying N-member compositions of different mineral phases can certainly be used, I think, to, to uh, extract more value from those regional um, or, or deposit scale um, geochemical sampling. And that's all I have for you tonight. Thanks, Sarah. I think that there's probably some really important implications here to industry that we can talk about because often there's maybe a need for either junior companies or major companies to understand that petrographic work, while they can't do it in the field or they can't do it easily, is very important to understanding targeting in those deposits and, and uh, down, the, down the line. So I think that's a good thing for us to talk about, especially with the students. Yeah, okay, we're going, to, we're going to move on to our third and final panelist, uh, Peter McGaw. Let me pull up my notes here. So Peter is a consulting exploration geologist, president of IMDEX and co-founder of Mag Silver and Minorum Gold. His PhD work at the University of Arizona was an exploration focused geo geological geochemical study of the Santa Eulalia silver lead zinc district in Chihuahua and carbonate replacement deposits of Mexico in general. He's published extensively on CRDs and epithermal vein deposits and is a frequent speaker at international academic and technical symposia. His primary exploration foci are CRDs and epithermal vein deposits, which he has worked on throughout the Cordillera of North and South America, Ireland, and Turkey. Peter was awarded the Society of Mining Engineers 2012 Robert M. Dreyer Award for Excellence in Applied Economic Geology and the PDAC 2017 Thayer Lindsley Award for Outstanding Exploration Success for the significant discoveries made by his team in Mexico. Peter. With that, Peter, I'll let you take it over. Let me stop sharing. Okay, my turn. Let's see if I can pull this up without too many stumbles on my way to having this um, presentation up here properly. I need to go to full screen. And are you getting one or both there, Lauren? I'm I'm at, I'm both, so I can see the presenter notes. Okay, so you don't want to see my presenter notes. I have to know what slide is coming next. So <laughs> it's a pleasure to uh, be invited to uh, be part of this uh, SEG session today. Um, I'm going to take a little bit different tack um, in terms of focusing on exploration and. Uh, how you find big deposits, which in this particular case, coincidentally, have a lot of zinc in them. So this is the discovery of Cinco de Mayo in Chihuahua, Mexico. Uh, this is a blind discovery. What you're seeing here is a pretty good idea of what the surface looks like. Uh, not a whole lot to work with. So working through cover is going to be the, 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 the future of exploration geology. Working through cover can be very expensive, so you want to get yourself as focused as you possibly can, as early as you possibly can. So I've been working in CRDs for a, 
better than 40 years. I started off as a volcanologist working with what are now called super volcanoes. In those days, we called them resurgent caldera rhyolitic systems uh, and recognized there wasn't a whole lot of work to be done involved with those in terms of remunerative work. Uh, but they're wonderful host rocks for epithermal veins. And in Mexico, especially, they cover uh, the carbonate rocks, which host the world's largest assemblage of carbonate replacement deposits, which are the backbone of the Mexican underground base metal mining industry. So think zinc, lead, and silver. Uh, the silver coming along with the lead, as uh, was explained um, by Duncan, uh, sorry, by uh, Paul at the very beginning. So I've been working on a number of these systems ever since from places like Tombstone, Arizona, uh, to as uh, Lauren said, Turkey, uh, and with some stopovers in Ireland to look at some of the uh, Irish type deposits and see how they overlap. So first of all, what is a CRD? As the name suggests, hosted in carbonate rocks, limestones or dolomites, high temperature deposits, clearly epigenetic, unlike what Sarah was talking about. Uh, they are sulfide rich as are many ore deposits. And, and another way of looking at what Sarah was talking about is that most ore deposits are fundamentally iron deposits, iron sulfide deposits contaminated with hopefully economically significant quantities of sphalerite and galena and some other fellow travelers. These deposits are intrusion related. They're polymetallic, so silver, lead, zinc, copper, and gold, plus a host of um, strategic elements. They're dominated by replacement, which is a totally different style of mineralization from uh, what we've heard about so far. Mineralization is continuous from the source to wherever the system runs out of gas. So wherever you can latch onto it, you can follow it back towards its source or out towards the pieces that haven't been found yet. Big deposits are polyphase evolving systems. So that gives you lots of complex overprinting and a lot of large scale zoning. So a lot of stuff to work with petrographically or visually. So at Cinco de Mayo, uh, this is a story of staged exploration, starting with probably 20 years of research on carbonate replacement deposits and their regional controls. Once we recognized what we thought some of that was, we went into systematic regional exploration, and which allowed us to tighten our search criteria, allowed us to develop a toolbox for seeing through cover, and got us enough credibility that we were able to get funded for what we were doing. Uh, we've been successful with that. And phase three is taking this on the road, looking for more. There's plenty of places to do this. The Western US, these used to be major deposit mines in the Western US. Uh, that's being revived now. They're being tracked up into Canada, up into Alaska, and in other parts of the world. So an emerging important deposit type. Here's a very simplified model for a, por for a CRD system. So you start with an intrusive stock. It's porphyritic, it may be barren, or it could be a porphyry copper or a porphyry moly system. Where that's emplaced into carbonates, in this case, limestone shown in blue, you develop early high temperature calc silicate scarn alteration that then is overprinted by the sulfide stage, which mineralizes the scarn. And then outboard of the calc silicate zone, you have four bodies, essentially massive sulfide. So they consist of nothing but galenus valerite, pyrite, or pyrite, calcopyrite, and some other things thrown in. Uh, these can extend for multiple kilometers away from that source or be very telescoped and localized where you have unreactive capping rocks. Uh, mineralization occurs as veins. And of course, over the porphyry center, you can have a classic porphyry style alteration to guide your exploration. When we look at these districts, they tend to be two styles. Uh, we talk about the skeletal hand model in systems like uh, Tintic, where you have uh, a porphyry intrusion down here with a series of parallel uh, ore trends extending away from it or the classic hub and spoke model, which is Bingham Canyon, one of the world's best known porphyry copper deposits. What people don't necessarily remember is that Bingham Canyon was surrounded by high grade lead zinc silver replacement bodies. And they were mined probably 50 million tons of that material for, for decades before they even started to mine on the porphyry copper. So hub and spoke 
skeletal hand, the take home message is that these systems never have just a single ore body. So if you latch onto one of them, you want to keep looking around because there's going to be more ore bodies in that system. So why do we look for them? They're big, 10 to 150 million tons. They're high grade, so high unit value and lots of credits in strategic minerals. They typically have low mining costs. They're heavily recrystallized, so they're metallurgically docile, so it's easy to make concentrates that would keep Paul happy. And they have a minimal environmental footprint since it's, they're mostly mined underground and a lot of your waste rock stays there. So as an explorationist, one of the first things I wanna know is, is what I'm looking at a giant or not and how quickly can I tell because I don't wanna spend my time looking for small deposits. And we've come up through years of research with a 13 point checklist that tells us the features that are characteristic of big deposits and different from smaller ones. The first three that you wanna be able to tick off the most important location. You wanna be on Main Street as far as a porphyry copper or CRD belt is concerned. You wanna be at the top of the carbonate section so the thing has room to grow. And I'm a silver focused guy, so I like to see silver over 400 grams. The other importance of 400 grams is that tells you you're pretty much not in one of the deposits that Sarah was talking about or an Irish type deposit, you are actually in the world of CRDs. So when we look at Mexico and the plots that you, the deposits that you see here on here, the red dots are the big deposits, the green dots are the small deposits. You don't have to have a PhD to recognize that you wanna focus exploration in that belt. And you'd like to understand why that is such a distinct linear feature, 2,200 kilometers long and only about 50 kilometers wide. So if you strip off a lot of the surface rocks and look at what we understand, and this is coming from the petroleum literature largely because Mexico was very well endowed with petroleum, what we see is that Mexico is composed of a series of positive and negative elements, platforms and basins, and the faults that control the platform margins seem to be where the biggest deposits form, especially up here in the Chihuahua trough. So if we look at the history of geologic history of Mexico, it has essentially been like an accordion with coaxial alternating compression and extension. So why did that do that to me? So if we go back to the middle Jurassic, Mexico was underneath undergoing extension uh, oriented in the direction of the yellow arrows. And that created a series of basin, uh, fault bounded basins, positive elements with the negative basins. And these were progressively flooded uh, from Southeast to Northwest during the like, second half of the Mesozoic. So thick accumulations of carbonates. And one of the things about that basin geometry is when you're in the basin, you get a very thick section of carbonates much thinner section of carbonates outboard of the basin. But keep your eye on that, that fault that's bounding that because that's the real actor that matters. Then during the Laramide, Europe collides with North America, you have compression. Mexico is folded into the, the Mexican fold thrust belt, um, which dominates the geology of Eastern Mexico. In the mid tertiary, Starting around 40 million years ago, the East Pacific rise approaches the subduction zone, which is continuously at, uh, present along the western coast of the Western Hemisphere, and it begins to be subducted, and that sets off this tectonic trigger of extension, and that extension causes this enormous magmatic event that gives you, especially the rhyolitic volcanism of the Sierra Madre Occidental, which is this famous uh, one of the biggest uh, rhyolitic volcanic fields in the world resulting from that extension. So when you put all of those pieces together, these deposits, the big ones lie at the western edge of the fold thrust belts, right along the faults where the, the, mineralization, the carbonate rocks were thickest, and then with compression where they were in when the basin, basin inversion, they were stacked up on top of each other to over thicken the sequence, and become structurally prepared. And then when these faults open up again to allow all this magmatism to come up, 
those magmas rise into shallow levels of the crust where they encounter thick, beautifully prepared sequences of carbonate rocks. That is the perfect recipe for making the CRD. So when you look at this belt from an exploration standpoint, you notice a certain periodicity of these deposits. And in certain places like here, and especially up here, you go, there's a big gap there. Why is that there? There ought to be another deposit. So we zoomed in on the Chihuahua trough with the understanding that existed at the time of the margins of the Chihuahua trough and decided to focus on that open stretch between Santa Eulalia and Bismarck. One of the places that we looked at, one of the first places we looked at actually was Cinco de Mayo. And as I pointed out earlier, there wasn't very much to see at Cinco de Mayo. There's this little ridge sitting out here in this ocean of alluvium. That's the ridge. It's about 300 meters wide and about a kilometer and a half, two kilometers long, completely surrounded by alluvium. But when you get out onto that ridge, you see this beautiful manto that was mined, dipping to the east, under cover to the east, and this beautiful multi-stage jasperoids. This is telling you there were multiple pulses of altering fluids in the system, and the inference is that there's multiple pulses of mineralizing fluids further down towards the source of the system. So you take the checklist, and just on what you can see on the surface at Cinco de Mayo, you can check eight out of the 13 boxes. That's pretty important in terms of deciding where to explore. But the next question is, how do you see through all that alluvium? What are you gonna to use to do that? So the first thing you do is you take whatever information you can get. This is a regional seismic profile from Pemex, Mexican uh, petroleum business. Uh, drop your model for an intrusion. There's what you can see on the surface. Here's all the uh, alluvium. And you go out and you do a bunch of geophysics. And so there's the ridge right there. You got a really hot conductor over here. The ridge, the limestones, as you expect, are resistors. Uh, and then a series of conductors out here, which we interpreted as being fault controlled uh, and decided to drill from those into the limestone. Uh, when we did that in this area, we got mineralization. We didn't get as much as we hoped for. We drilled the hot red one over here. We got a bunch of black shale. Uh, and when we drilled out here, um, we got some really interesting uh, high temperature, strong uh, hornfells with widespread dispersed zinc and lead sulfide. So this justified enough to get out and do a one and a, good results over one and a half kilometers justified flying airborne geophysics mag and Z10. And it was remarkable how much we could see through that alluvium with the ZTEM, and we started recognizing some of these mag lows, uh, which turn out to be remnant and related to intrusions, and started drilling around those. So hole, hole number 20 on the project uh, was the first hole that we put into that area. We got beautiful massive sulfide mineralization, lots of pyrite, lots of brecciation, multi-stages of mineralization. We continued to drill the footprint. That's all through complete cover. There's that ridge back there, three and a half kilometers away. Uh, and we got a lot of interesting things. In addition to sulfides, we got multiple meter wide coarse calcite veins. These are fugitive calcite. This is the exhaust from the replacement process. They show up beautifully with a shortwave ultraviolet light. This is uh, from your, this is uranium activation caused by uh, a, a weathering of volcanics, but the, the pink stuff is what you want to follow. We see beautiful pebble dikes, injection breaches, felsic intrusions, all associated with sulfide mineralization, all features that allow us to, to now check nine, uh, excuse me, 11 out of the 13 boxes, telling us we're in the right place. We continued to drill in this direction. We lost the manto. We didn't understand why, but we backed off and looked at the data and said, well, in this area, we're getting scarn, we're getting tungsten, we're getting gold. The fluids don't look like they came from this direction or that direction, so they must have come from the, to the southwest. So we jumped over the range. So that hole would have been here. This is the body of the range. Here's this huge mag anomaly uh, on the west side of the range, about three and a half kilometers away. 
when we go over to that side of the mountain, uh, we have just about as much exposure to work with as we did on the west side, on the east side, sorry, uh, which is to say practically nothing. But we had this geophysics, we had this beautiful VTEM linear anomaly, we drilled that and we got molybdenum mineralization associated with gold. Uh, we didn't know what this thing was, but we were able to drill it out on 250 meter centers uh, along a two and a half kilometer strike lane, 300 meters wide and from 17 to 300 meters thick. Uh, we were able to get about a 50 million ton resource at very high grade for a molly deposit. This sounded really good when molly was $35 a pound, but molly had dropped to about 12 by the time we did this. So that wasn't very important anymore. But what was important is we could compare that molly zone with what we see in other carbonate replacement systems. The San Martin mine in Zacatecas, Mexico was Mexico's biggest scar and replacement mine. Um, and off to one side of mineralization is a molly zone. 200 meters in diameter and 20 meters thick compared to the biggest scar in, Me in Mexico. We're looking at one that's more than 100 times bigger than that, telling us we think that we're looking at a much bigger system. So then we start looking at the system with sort of mega glasses on. Let's look at it with respect at the same scale to Bingham Canyon, to San Martin, et cetera. And we start working our way around the system and we find multiple hotspots. None of them pan out particularly well. So we finally come back to the Jose Monto to figure out where we lost it. We've since recognized thrust stacking was more complex than we thought. So we did a bunch of geophysics. Again, this is 3D IP. We come up with a strong anomaly outboard of the holes that we drilled where we lost it. Uh, we put the holes in and bang, there it was. We were able to offset those on 250 meter centers and were able to connect mineralization from the ridge all the way to the far end of the Jose Manto, over four kilometers in strike length. So when we look at this in long section, uh, there it is, uh, vertical distance of about 350 meters in most sections. And we were able to get a resource on that, 12 and a half million tons of pretty nice zinc grade, um, decent silver, decent lead, but an enormous monto. We're looking at this going, this geometry is telling us something. This looks like fluids must have come up and worked their way out into overlapping thrust sheets. So essentially think of a closet door that slides past each other with fluids going into one side here, one side the other. This begged for a hole to go in here. So we started to drill that. We got 400 meters of pervasive marble and scarn. And then bang, we hit five massive sulfide intercepts, one which in composite is 62 meters long of 0.8 gold. Didn't have much gold at the surface, little less silver. Copper starting to show up at 0.13, two and a half lead. And zinc has gone up to 7.3%. When you look at individual sections like this 14 meter section in here, the grades are much higher, almost 14%. So we model the whole thing together. There's the upper Monto. Here's the Pegaso zone, uh, which we believe is the feeder to all of this. And the next job, of course, is to follow this back towards its intrusive center. But all of this is all of this, when we look at it in the district perspective, is telling us there's so much more going on here. There's that. Pegaso Jose Monto. We've got another scar down here. We've got the Molly zone over here. So we've got one of the biggest Montos ever found. Got a huge Molly gold zone, massive scar and mineralization. We haven't hit the source intrusion yet. And 97% of our holes are hitting at least some mineralization. So only six dusters on the property and true dusters on the property. So everything's telling us there's a mega system here. So the takeaways are, do your homework. Research can pay off, especially if you're in a doctoral program and you have the time to do that kind of work. You have to be persistent. You have to be able to sell the project. We hit the Pegaso zone on hole 431. That required consistent, effective communication of why the system should be there, comparison with known giants, and focus on the features that tell us there's something important. And we have to use this iterative process of techniques that can see through cover and techniques that 
tell us to keep going. So where do you go from there? You look around. There's a lot of other places in the world where these CRD deposits exist. And that's in the basin and range, that's in Alaska, that's in Eastern Europe. Um, it's even in China. China is very well endowed with these deposits. So lots of you, lots of things for you to work with uh, in your careers going forward. And uh, the, the, the techniques of working through cover and narrowing yourself down to get into corridors where you're going to get the most bang for your exploration buck uh, is a very, very important thing to work on. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Oh, thanks so much, Peter. I think that's a really interesting exploration story and useful for the students and ECPs in the audience. So we have just about 15 minutes or so for our Q&A discussion. Um, I'd like to start first uh, back with Paul. I'm interested to know, you know, when we look at precious metal deposits, uh, there's usually the idea that the concentrations of trace trace elements that may or may not be used as critical elements is not very well understood, maybe because people are just assaying for gold and silver. Do you sort of find that that's true in these sorts of deposits? I mean, or would you say that the concentrations in general of something like germanium or indium are very low and it's kind of a red herring to make deposits more economic that might not be? Yeah, I think, um... <laughs> Unless it's like a really exceptional value, the the, the yeah the, the dollars, um, yeah the the, the the dollars associated with the indium are relatively small, um, uh, yeah compared to you know the lead, zinc, and silver. Unless it's like an exceptionally high assay of, of indium, um, so. Um, I think it gets assayed for. By the time you, by the time you're so far into a a, a project, yeah, you know, you've got to concentrate that you're producing, or you've even done um, flotation test work. I think I think you're you're assaying for that. Um, I, I, I think, but I think it's a point. Yeah, you know, if you're developing a project, I think it's um, it, it's it's risky to um, you know. Put put your your Indian revenues as part of your sort of um, you know base cases. It's, it's, it's maybe upside risk or something. Um, as, 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 uh, quite quite often, you know, it might be um, you, you know it, it, the the value of the Indian reflected in its marketability over you know the, the entire commodity cycle, or you might get a slightly lower treatment charge or, or whatever. But I can't think of many examples where you know you're setting your concentrates and you've got like an Indian payment formula um, going with it. I mean, there's maybe maybe one or two exceptionally high Indian bearings in concentrates, but uh, it, it's, it's definitely not common. Yeah, I'll just clear quickly on the subject of Indian because in carbonate replacement deposits, Indium is a really useful indicator of proximity to heat. Indium goes more easily into sphalerite at higher temperatures, and so it is a very useful indicator. So you should pay lots of attention to indium. You should pay attention to germanium for the opposite reason, because it tends to concentrate in the lower temperature parts of the system. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that is very interesting. Sarah, do you find that there's there's a lot of research going on? Do you know if there's a lot of research going on in this sphere about these, these sort of trace elements? Oh, I mean, I think, yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, this laser ablation technique, I think there's, there's, you know, as an A in economic geology, I'm constantly being bombarded with lots and lots of papers on this. And of course, um, you know, I think this, the laser ablation ICPMS, so one of the questions is why use that rather than microprobe? And it's because the detection limits, you can measure things down to parts per billion. And so I think these techniques really help you understand these minor and trace element distributions. Um, but of course, if you were looking at sphalerite, it's also then connects to the geomets, right? Because you need to know what elements are in your, your, your ore mineral because you've got to deal with that at the smelter. So um, yeah, so I think there's lots of different applications. Yeah. I think the other thing I'd add, Lauren, is of course markets are dynamic. Yeah, you know, the Indian price suddenly went higher, there'd be more attention to it, and maybe you'd be mm -hmm. more likely to get paid. But unfortunately, 
the whole Indian story has been dominated by, you know, Chinese stocks and, um, you know, whether they could get dumped on the market or whatever. So, so, so the Indian price has been um, um, sort of, you know, the, the lo lo lower than it has been uh, recently. But, yeah, the, the, these things always change according to, to market conditions. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And I'm glad that Peter had some advice, too, for how you use these in, in an exploration setting. I was wondering, Peter, how... How does your exploration strategy maybe change? Because you're, you're talking about a huge area that might have multiple deposits from like a CRD to a porphyry. So at that level, like how, how do you change your exploration strategy, whether it's geochemical or geochemical? Well, that's, a, that's the subject of another talk altogether. But uh, the, yes, the, the exploration techniques that you use for finding the distal part of the system are very different from what you use to try to find the proximal source of the system. But the ideal thing is to locate that source as soon as you can, because then you can work both ends against the middle. And that's there's geophysical techniques that you can use to try to find the intrusive center um, and obviously large scale metal zoning. There's even large scale carbon and oxygen isotope zoning uh, which we can now work with on a practical basis because you can get hundreds of analyses done in a day uh, at relatively low cost. And you can map out the halo, uh, which gives you a footprint for the magnitude and the extent of the system uh, and lets you know very easily whether or not you're actually dealing with a giant or not. So I'm all in favor of whatever will tell me that. Yeah, absolutely. There are, there's a few questions in the chat maybe about the difference between the diagenetic and hydrothermal pyrite as it compares to other deposits, and also what that might look like in something like a black smoker or a VMS deposit. Do you have any comments on that? Sure. So um, um, I guess we, we haven't done a lot of work on VMS deposits, but there certainly are lots of groups working um, on both sort of black smoker systems, or at least, you know, once the, the pyrite really um, obviously can be sampled and cooled down. And, and so it's actually sort of in the sediments or in the volcanic plastics. And typically you sort of see the thallium enrichment and often you see this arsenic enrichment as well. Um, in terms of the application to other deposits, there's actually very few um, well-constrained, open access, multi-element data sets that are published out there to test whether, for example, that ratio that Joe came up with works in other deposits. Because even up until five years ago, people would plot, you know, the average of their data, you know, their average for each element or something like that. They don't give you all the data. And actually, to really play around with these things, we need all the data. Um, so we actually rely a lot on our colleagues in industry because, you know, they have large data sets with multi-element data. Um, but of course, that's collected at a different scale. Um, so, so we're happy for people to test the ratio, um, but there, there are very few studies out there on these deposits that have the data that allow you to do that. Excellent. That's a good point. Um, there was a question in here for Paul about the uh, sort of circular economy concept with new companies focusing on reworking tailings. How yep. long uh, might it take to replace a big portion of primary sources? Mm, yes, um, I mean, it's obviously a good idea, and you know the grinding, uh, the mining and grinding has already been done. So you know you you, you cost a lot. I suppose the example you'd look at is Century Zinc in uh, Australia, um, and yeah, they're producing, um, but yeah. I mean, you've got, you've got to ask the question, what has changed to change this material from tailings as it was, you know, you know whenever the mine shut, to the, and it's now ore again. Has the metal price gone up? Has technology improved that much? Um, and it's, it's, it's yeah, there, there, are, there are technical challenges. You know, the, the, the quality's sort of not great um, in, in terms of, you know, in, in, in impurities, etc. So it's part, of, I'd say, tailings retreatment is part of the jigsaw. It's definitely part of the story. And if it makes sense, then great. But I think it's only one part of the overall filling in that supply gap, yeah, rather than some sort of silver bullet. Yeah, 
um, yeah, yeah, it, it comes with different challenges to you know, primary ore mining, I guess. I think there's a that's a great point. Um, you know, you had said earlier that maybe the zinc is not not as critical to the sort of green resource transition than than maybe copper. So that's a very interesting point. Um, Sarah, there's a good question in here. Uh, does new pyrite data confirm previous geologic understanding on both deposits, or were you able to provide some new insight? Um, so I think at the, I think at George Fitcher, the fact that there are multiple phases of um, of mineralization has been documented before. There was an excellent thesis by Lucy Chapman um, quite some time ago that basically just you know really put that apart. So I think that's been seen before, and I think this cobalt and nickel tenor is seen obviously in the in the concentrates and in the larger scale um, analyses. Um, so I guess there's there's already a framework there um, to to see that. I think um, in um, in Tina, I think what 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 we've shown there is the fact that the footprint is not over the whole sub basin. And, and I think this comes down to what you would expect if you're basically making a deposit in the sediment as opposed to exhaling into the seawater. So actually your exploration strategy would have to change in terms of you know, how far away from a potential deposit you might be expecting to see these hydrothermal signals. So I think that's sort of a practical application um, of that there. And certainly learning to recognize this diagenetic pyrite because in, in, in Australia, there are layers of diagenetic pyrite in basins that have no zinc mineralization and they light up in geophysics as well. So I think there's, you know, a lot of people have drilled a lot of holes that have pyrite in it. Um, and, you know, really then the question is, where's the hole, you know, is this pyrite anything to do with sphalerite? That's really, you know, and I think this is kind of what we're getting at with these types of studies. Yeah, and it, it sort of goes back to what I had said at the end of your end of your presentation, which is very good, in that it's it may be hard to convince explorers that this type of research is valuable. So do you find that you work with companies a lot to try and convince them that they need to get the petrography, they need to do the microanalyses, or do you find that that exactly, resistance is going away? I think that's exactly the way. We, we can never, you know, sample a whole deposit on the scale of a deposit. So all you can do is take a small number of really well well constrained samples and take those apart and then use that information. So for example, at Tina, you know, we, we did that on four or five drill holes, but we use those end member compositions to work with the company's database that has, you know, 10,000 analyses in it, right? So you can add value in that way, but it is not really ever going to be possible for an exploration company, you know, to, to be sending people to take pictures of, of kinds of rims on pyrites, you know, I mean, it's just not practical. So I think this is really where the industry research marriage is at its most productive is, is, is at the scale, this sort of scale of analyses. Peter, would you have anything to, to comment on from the industry perspective on that? Uh, well, just that we love supporting um, well thought out um, new technologies that can assist with what we're doing in, in, in exploration. Uh, we've done it with the carbon and oxygen work at uh, Cinco de Mayo, we're doing it at Deer Trail, and we're doing it at Santa Eulalia. Uh, we've worked with other groups and in industry before, we think it's really important for companies to support this um, because in the long term, that's where some of your ideas that ultimately can be turned into practical things that you can apply in the field uh, will come from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did want to ask you, Peter, uh, it's sort of one of these things that we hear a lot when we have talks about discovery and the decline in discoveries. Are CRDs rare? Are they too deep? Are they unfound? Are they dwindling in number? What do you think? Well, I mean, if I, just to take the example of Mexico, uh, if you, for not just CRDs, but for all deposit types in Mexico, uh, most of the deposits in Mexico were found in outcrop within about 150 years of the Spanish conquest. And those deposits have seen uh, 
multiple renaissances as there have been tech advances in technology from as simple as going from uh, the development of black powder to the development of flotation to the development of cyanidation versus amalgamation. Um, and that's where most of the Mexican mining industry resides. But it is absurd to believe in a country that is 60% covered by alluvium or younger volcanics that all of those deposits cropped out on the surface. And you can make the same argument for the Western US and places where they're covered with boreal forests and things like that, or Australia, where you're looking at 30 or 40 meters of deep weathering, which effectively is the same as cover that you have to look through. Uh, the deposits are there, the distributions are there. It's just a question of coming up with tools that let you find them through cover efficiently. It's more expensive, it's more time consuming, that's why I like looking for deposits where we can understand what the regional trends are that tell us, here's where the big ones are. Let's look for the places where there's something missing on those belts. Won't be able to do that forever, but it's carried me pretty well through my career. And there's plenty of people out there and plenty of space left to uh, follow those particular guidelines. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a good message to sort of say, you know, you can start with some, a lot of desktop work. You don't necessarily have to go out right into the field right away. Um, we are getting to... Petroleum information, God forbid. <laughs> it is out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are sort of getting to the end. I mean, Sarah's almost completely encapsulated by dark. <laughs> so I think, I think I will um, ask one last question, which is just maybe for the students in the ECPs and maybe Peter can start. What would be sort of your takeaway message for, for early career geologists or students getting into the industry? Like what's maybe the number one skill or something you've found that's been really helpful for you in your career? Learn how to do your homework. Learn how to read the geologic literature. There's a phenomenal amount of information out there. Recognize that Plate tectonics only came into under our application in ore deposits in the mid-1970s. I had professors in school who denied plate tectonics. But the application, if you look at the history of, of exploration for certain types of deposits, there's a lot of them out there that were extensively exploited before we recognize plate tectonics. People have not gone back and re-examined the literature in terms of how these deposit distributions exist uh, in that framework in a lot of places, especially in a lot of places with a lot of cover. If you can carve out a niche for yourself in terms of the deposit type that's likely to be desirable in an area that has been well overlooked, you can carve out a niche that will last you for a career. I think that's a very good message. Sarah, to you. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Peter that, that I think there, there, there's a lot of reason that needs to be done. And, and you know, I, I feel like Every 20 years, the, the wheel is reinvented in, in some parts of, of our science. Um, but what I would say is, is that it's about the rocks. And, um, you know, you can't forget that no matter what fancy analytical technique you're doing, and, you know, whether it's, it's at, at the atomic scale, which people are publishing on now, all the way up, it's got to be in the 3D architecture that brings us back to the Earth process. And I would say as, as earth scientists, as geologists, as economic geologists, time is our special skill, right? And so it's not just that 3D concept, it's 4D. And that's what we need to always be thinking about. How does my tiny analysis of this mineral, what does it mean in 4D? Um, and so that's what we need to think about, I think. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Just from my own research, I know that there's a tendency to get too zoomed in on that single grain. Yeah. Yes. And then, Paul, you've maybe had what could be a sort of non-traditional career for people that may have studied geology or studied mining, but are looking to not necessarily live in a tent and log core for months on end. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would be your advice? Um, well, it, it probably sort of it's, it's do as I say, not do as I do. As I'd say, learn another language. I mean, you, 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 you know, um, if, if, you, if you can speak Chinese or, or Spanish as well as English, you know, that that's that that that, that that's a major thing. I think I alluded to it in, um, uh, you know, 
in, in my introduction, you know, the, 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 don't forget the mining industry is small. You know, you, you never know who you're going to, you know, you know, bump into. You know, networking is so important. Building a, you know, a career in this industry, but I think also get some good practical advice first. Because I'd done a lot of um, practical engineering. Yeah, you know, I started off you know, working in a lab and all the rest of it. So before I became a consultant and an analyst, I'd like done lots of practical stuff. Uh, and I think that's very important as well. I mean, particularly when I was at Wood Mac, we saw loads of people leaving Imperial College and then just jumping straight into be, being a uh, uh, an analyst of one one sort or another. And I think yeah, a lot of them saw it as a stepping stone into the city. But I think I, I've definitely benefited from having some sort of practical industry um yeah knowledge before getting into the um the, the consultancy side yeah i think that's a great point for all geologists just to understand kind of the life cycle of a mine too you know not just to be familiar only with one piece yeah um yeah. and it's a good note on the the networking opportunity to uh make sure that we plug for the seg 2023 conference i totally agree with paul most of the jobs i've ever gotten have just been knowing people so SEG uh, is hosting its 2023 annual conference in London. It's in late August, 26th to 29th. And the chosen theme, which goes very along with this, very well with this uh, webinar series, is resourcing the green transition. The conference addresses major challenges presented by accelerated consumption of energy transition and other strategic metals. The context is global, but the spotlight is really on Europe's metallogenic domains, past and future exploration, and mining potential. There's also an entire day of student and early career initiatives during the conference, including roundtable discussions, networking events, student-focused talks, resume booths, and mentorship opportunities. I think that's before the conference, so please check the schedule to make sure that you have time to attend those. And visit the website for latest information. Just a note that early registration for the conference ends tomorrow, Friday, June 30th. And like I said, there are, there's lots of uh, workshops around uh, the conference that are being planned to expand on the key themes from technical program, including offerings on critical minerals, ESG, and resource estimation masterclass, which is a very popular one. The registration is open, but those early bird rates will, will disappear on the 30th. So consider signing up now. And then this is a final thank you to all our panelists for their time today and to SEG and our sponsors, MapTech. And to please join us for our third and fourth webinars near the end of this year. Thanks everybody and have a great evening. <laughs>